Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out this evening. Um, as you can tell, I gave this talk almost more than four years ago at the DDO. It's kind of a small audience, so I thought maybe I'd recycle it for the general membership to um, listen to, and, and they might get something informative out of it. So I'd like to share some insights on when and what to use to clean your optics. So this won't be a how-to talk, because there's lots of YouTube videos that show you how to clean your optics. Um, so telescopes are fairly expensive, and like most owners who, ex who own expensive things, they want to take care of them. But the common sense notion to keep your optics pristine and clean is actually wrong. Um, we shouldn't be actively cleaning our optics, and we're likely cleaning the wrong optics and in the wrong way. So in this cartoon here, Fergus, in his overzealous um, cleaning of his uh, reflector mirror, has worn off that thin, aluminized reflective layer and turned his mirror into a lens. Uh, the same thing can happen to a refractor. If you clean your refractor objective lens too much, you run the risk of wiping off those very important anti-reflective um, coatings. So in uh, Harold Suter's famous book, um, he talks about the effect of dirt and scratches on optical performance. So there's uh, dirt and scratches um, cause generalized scattering of light, and the effect is mainly seen when you're looking at bright objects like planets, and it causes low contrast details to become washed out. So in other words, dirty optics really has a negligible effect on your telescope, because don't forget that telescopes already have to contend with huge obstructions like the spider veins of a secondary mirror or the central obstruction of the secondary mirror itself. So if, um, oops, I am, okay, that's right. Yeah, this is a simulation of your eight inch uh, Schmidt castle grain corrector plate. So according to uh, Suter's math, as long as the dirt is less than one tenth of 1% of the area of your optics, you can ignore it. So that's, in this case is 30 square millimeters or about a pinch of salt. But realistically, you can probably throw a teaspoon of salt onto your telescope and it won't matter. Because don't forget, um, you won't see these things because they're not at the focal point. You don't have to worry about dirt that accumulates closer to the focal point. So in other words, you need to clean your eyepieces, your bar loads, your focal reducers, your diagonals, which in a, new, in a reflector is your secondary, uh, your, any filters that you have, and if you're an imager, your camera sensor. And this is what a dirty camera sensor looks like. All those dust motes will have a real effect on your image. So the best defense, or the best, is a good defense against dirt, is um, to store your eyepieces with end caps on both ends, or put them in eye bolt cases. And you've got the equivalent for your Barlow and your diagonal as well, too. So when you're not using them, store them this way. Um, so some of you who have those small, high focal length eyepieces, which come with a very um, small eye relief, will have to clean their eye lenses a lot because um, you, they'll accumulate a lot of eyelash oil and grime. And um, diagonals are also made to be taken apart and cleaned regularly as well. So the question is, why can you clean these guys so often, but you can't clean other parts of your telescope that often? So traditionally, the thin aluminum reflective layer of a mirror is made by evaporating um, aluminum with either heat or electron beam in a vacuum chamber, and it just passively disperses and deposits onto the glass mirror surface itself. So this forms a very porous, very weak, um, not a very dense layer that's uh, very easy to damage if you don't wash it carefully, and, and as a result, you should wash it very rarely. So the reason why you can clean your eyepieces, especially the eye lenses, is it's designed probably without coating so that you can clean as much as you want without having to fear rubbing anything off. Uh, the diagonal is a different matter. Um, most modern diagonals are not made with that aluminum reflective layer. They're made with these dielectric coatings. So these are alternating metal oxide layers of different refractive indices. And there's literally hundreds of these layers. 
and they combine to give you almost 100% reflectivity and a very, very hard surface. So you can clean this every single day and it's not gonna damage it. So the question remains is that why don't we coat mirrors with this method? Uh, the problem is that the, each layer has to be absolutely uniformly the same thickness. Otherwise, you run the risk of altering the figure of the mirror. And the other problem too is that these coatings cannot be uh, chemically stripped they have to be ground off. So that would also damage your mirror if you wanted to ever uh, recoat the mirror at some point in the future. Um, this is just an interesting study I wanted to throw in here. Uh, this is an amateur astronomer, William Paolini. And he uh, is also an eyepiece expert. He's written a, um, a book about eyepieces. And he did tests between the conventional um, aluminum ref reflective um, diagonal or, and, a pr and prism diagonals versus these modern dielectric diagonals. And he agreed that the modern ones are much tougher and they're much brighter, but they're not as accurate. Um, when he views planets, for example, he loses a lot of contrast and detail because those hundreds of dielectric coatings cause the mirror no longer to be optically flat. So if you are um, a real intense visual observer, I would stick with the traditional um, aluminum reflective uh, um, diagonal or prism diagonal. Although these are, these um, dielectric ones are very good for the average viewer. So have, there have been advances to make mirrors tougher so that you can wash them occasionally. So the, this, 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 this method uses um, uh, an iron gun to, sh to actually hit the aluminum layer and compress it further to increase its density. And if you, in, if you uh, include a stream of sodium monoxide with oxygen, you actually get a, an overcoat of um, sodium um, dioxide, which is quartz, and that makes it even tougher. Or essentially, sorry, silicon dioxide. And, and then the final method, um, you, use, you actually, instead of evaporating the metal with just heat, you bombard it with really high speed ions and it gives more kinetic energy to the outgoing aluminum and it strikes the, the glass mirror with even more force and causes an even denser, tougher uh, mirror layer. So this again is also um, a, a surface that's easier to, to clean occasionally. Yeah, so um, so this is sort of similar to putting your eyepieces in, in, in um, eye bolt caps. You have to always remember to use your anti-dew equipment, um, anti, uh, your dew straps or your dew shields to prevent dew and frost from forming. What happens is that this introduces atmospheric contaminants to your telescope and it also cements any pre-existing debris that was already on that surface and makes it much even, even harder to remove later on. So the first step is always debriding the surface and I would recommend using a soft brush or one of these air bulbs, which you can buy at camera stores. A lot of people use canned air, and that is not a good idea. Um, there's lots of additives in the propellant, which you don't want evaporating onto, onto the optical surface. And also, if you don't hold the can perfectly vertical, a full can sometimes um, spews out the propellant itself. And here's a little video demonstrating that. See, that's a propellant actually leaking out of the can. So that happens when you hold it more horizontal, obviously. If you hold it more vertical, it's that less, less chance of that happening. Um, there was an internet rumor that the temperature of the fluorocarbon in propellant is minus 100 degrees Celsius. If that were the case, you'd end up having microfractures in the glass and also in the coatings, too. So I took a thermo digital th thermometer, so I was curious to see how cold it really was. It's only about minus 38, so it's not really quite that dangerous. <coughs> so there's quite a few um, really popular cleaners. One from Zeiss, and there's no better company than Zeiss when it comes to optics. Um, Optical Wonder is marketed by Bader Planetarium. And both of these have organic solvents to help dissolve um, the oils from fingerprints and eyelashes, and also um, an aqueous component to help dissolve any mineral contaminants. 
And then the third one is called Purisol. This is different. They um, advertise as being made from um, enzymes of plant extracts, which break the bonds between dirt and glass, and then reverse the charge on the glass to prevent um, future dirt from accumulating. And so in this day and age of health and safety, all you have to do is look at the um, manufacturer's safety data sheet to see what is in, inside these um, cleaners. As you can see, this ice one is simply a 6% solution of um, isopropyl alcohol. And the beta one is a mixture of ethanol and propanol. The Purisol safety sheet has nothing on it because there's nothing toxic in it. It's completely organic, completely eco-friendly. Um, and as a result, it's very popular uh, in environments where fire is um, a real problem because it's completely not flammable. So it's used extensively in NASA. <coughs> so you can also make your own because as you see, the Zeiss was simply a 6% solution of isopropyl alcohol. So there's really no need to, to spend the money to buy the Zeiss cleaner. You can make your own. Uh, but you just have to be careful picking the reagents. You want to pick something that's really pure. Uh, we can get stuff from Canadian Tire hardware stores, but generally that, those, those um, solvents are not very, not very pure. They've probably got lots of contaminants in them. And of course, once they evaporate, they'll leave those contaminants behind. So a good place is the drugstore. So for example, Shoppers Drug Mart has 99%. This is like chemical reagent grade alcohol. And it's also a good place to pick up distilled water as well. So the Arkansas Sky Observatory has their own recipe, and it's um, listed here. Uh, was, the only component that's a little strange is the photo flow. And that's available at Kodak, or uh, sorry, at Henry's. It's um, a surfactant. It reduces the surface tension of that cleaning, cleaner recipe so that it wets the glass easier and also causes everything to evaporate faster. So the reason why this picture is here, um, there was a rumor, again, on the internet that there's something inside Windex that causes it to always leave smears. And this, this stuff might even be abrasive. And I was curious. I said, is there really something in there? Because I, I personally don't like Windex. Every time I use it, it seems to always leave something on the, on the, on the glass. So I thought, let's uh, centrifuge some Windex and see if there's something that's really insoluble inside the Windex um, solution. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a centrifuge is, it's, um, it's a really important piece of biomedical equipment. It, you, um, it subjects um, a solution to high G-forces, so that anything that's suspended in that solution is rapidly precipitated to the bottom. So I thought I'd make my own um, centrifuge. This is, um, th this is what is called a centrifuge bucket. It's what the centrifuged sample tubes sit in. And this, this is just um, a, uh, material from an underground sprinkler system. I'm just weighing it to make sure they're approximately the same weight. And then I just tie them together to a piece of metal with a shaft that fits perfectly into my Dremel. And that's going into my sink with a piece of plexiglass covering it just in case something terrible happens. And there's some video here which we can watch. Oh, it's got sound, even better. Scotty, I need more power. Yeah, in, in this video here, I, I wanted to see how fast it was spinning so I could sort of use the math and figure out how much G was being applied to the solution. So this is just an, this is an Arduino's um, strobe light so I can figure out how fast it was spinning.
Okay. So if you guys know anything about timing a car, you know you've got that strobe, and when everything stops moving, then you know you've got the, the, the frequency of the strobe is the same frequency as, as the rotation. So as it turns out, it's, a, it's um, 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 applying 9000G to the Windex solution. So I spun it for 10, 10 minutes, and this is the result. There is something in the Windex. Probably not part of the Windex, Windex recipe, probably some contaminant from a dirty bottle making factory. So I also um, spun some distilled water just to make sure it wasn't something from the centrifuged tubes themselves. That came out clear. And I filtered the Windex through a couple of coffee filters, and that also came out clear. So this is a, a good way to, to use Windex, is you could pre-filter it first before actually using it for anything, you know, even, even your kitchen windows. So this was another little experiment. I, I wanted to see, sort of quantify how good these cleaners are. So I wanted to simulate um, atmospheric contamination on um, optics. So I've got a little ultrasonic humidifier and some Epsom salts, which is magnesium sulfate. I dissolved that in the, in the um, ultrasonic uh, humidifier. I picked up some surplus shed um, um, reflect, uh, anti-reflectively coated optical windows. And they, they're being blasted by the humidifier. And that's the end result. So this would be this would simulate really really bad um, contamination from doing repeated doing cycles. So in order to quantify, I was going to I was going to stick the dirty glass uh, slide into a spectrophotometer, uh, measure its transmission, and then stick it in the, one of the cleaning solutions for five seconds without agitating it, just let it sit passively in it, take it out, and then put it back in again and measure the transmission and see if there's a difference. Um, again, for those who aren't familiar with spectrophotometers, it's another piece of biomedical equipment. It's, you introduce a, a monochromatic beam of light uh, to a sample, and that light comes from a rotating prism or a diffraction grid, and then there's a photo cell on the other end of the light to measure how much of that original light is actually transmitted. So, <laughs> Is, instead of buying, you could buy, you could buy one of these for less than 100 bucks. Um, uh, uh, certainly a used student spectrophotometer, but I frankly have too much junk at home, so I thought I'd, I'd make um, a, a sort of like a digital spectrophotometer. This is not a real one. It kind of simulates it because it doesn't really produce monochromatic light, but it does produce the whole spectrum of light because there's um, an RGB LED, and by altering the components of the RG and B, you can, you can simulate um, all the colors in, in the visible spectrum. So it's a really simple design. The sketch is really quite simple too. And this is, this is it in action. You can see all the different colors that it produces. So it goes from all the red, from red to purple. That was obviously at Christmas time many years ago. And so this is the Arduino. This is a, a block of polycarbonate where I glued the LED and the photocell across from each other and I cut a slit where the glass slide would fit in. I just got some red celluloid tape in there just for a practice run. And then you have to cover everything up to make it light tight so that ambient light doesn't interfere with the readings. <coughs> so you can see um, that it should be a, a nice flat transmission across the top, but it falls in the blue sector because the photocell is not as sensitive in the blue spectrum. Oh, and you can see the red tape that I put in there works quite well because it transmits in the red, but then by the time you reach green and blue, it starts to drop until it's zero in the, in the blue spectrum, which is the way it should be. So we've got uh, the first experiment was with uh, pure alcohol. And as you can see, the dirty glass and the alcohol, which is the red and green here, are the same. So it, the alcohol really did nothing in terms of cleaning the, 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 the contaminants off the glass. But the Purisol did really well because after, after five seconds, it, it's, its transmission profile is very similar to basically clean glass. And same with AOS, ASO fluid, that um, homemade recipe. You can see that the blue and green here are very similar. And lastly, I just want to introduce this last product here. Um, it's called First Contact um, by photo Photonic Cleaning Technologies. I heard of this similar product years ago for cameras. Um, it's uh, a polymer that you paint onto your optics. 
let it dry until it's a semi-solid film, and then you pull the whole thing off and it's supposed to take all the contaminants that's on the glass away with it. The only problem is it's pretty expensive. This little uh, kit is 100 bucks, and that's only enough material for an eight inch mirror. So here's uh, an example of it in action. And as you can see, it's not really that good. To be fair, probably it works better if you debride some of the major contaminants off first, and then as a last step, apply this material. So in conclusion, don't clean your telescope optics too often. Do clean your eyepieces, diagonals, barlows, reducers, and filters. Don't use Windex unless you filter through some coffee filters. 6% uh, isopropyl alcohol solution is, is good, and it's really inexpensive. And I probably would not buy the first contact, as it is rather expensive for what it does. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> any questions? Or any online questions? Oh, at the very back. Uh, would you recommend using, say, Q-tips uh, dipped in um, the solution to clean? That's probably what I would use for eye pieces. Although I'm not an expert in actual cleaning per se, you know, like YouTube would have a lot of examples of people actually physically cleaning, you know, optics and showing you the best way for doing that. These are sort of a, a lens pen with the activated carbon. Are they any good? I haven't tried one, so I can't tell you. Um, I, I imagine they're, they're probably OK, yeah, because if, 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 if they work on cameras, which basically are telescopes of a sort, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you need to, uh, to use some special products when you deal with fluorite lenses? I don't, I don't believe so. I don't, I don't think that matters. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>